Thank you so much for joining us here today at uh, this beautiful new Plymouth Housing Building. Some of you were at the announcement of the groundbreaking, which seems like it happened just yesterday because it was right before the pandemic when we were at KEXP. And it's so great to see that while we were struggling with so many challenges in the city, we kept going on things that were so important to this community. Kristen Benson Place is just one example of the type of amazing permanent supportive housing projects that we built together in Seattle for four years. This space right across the street from Seattle Center where there's a beautiful new arena and other exciting things happens provides 91 units, 91 units with direct access to one of our city's greatest arts and culture hubs. And in partnership with Path to Art, it will provide art spaces for residents and the public. One of my top priorities in the budget this year was to expand access to incredible spaces just like this one for some of our most underserved residents in Seattle. We know that the cost of housing has skyrocketed in recent years and building more affordable housing has been one of my most critical priorities. In the last four years as I've been mayor, the city has invested $450 million that we were able to leverage to more than $1.8 billion in new affordable housing for thousands of residents. We've acquired, preserved, or created 6,600 units of affordable housing. That's a remarkable achievement and it would not have been possible without great partners like Plymouth, without the residents of the city of Seattle, and the voters who voted for a housing levy. I also want to thank my Office of Housing who has been working so hard over the last four years to find creative ways and innovative ways to make sure that we could create housing as quickly as possible to serve our city. The 2022 budget invests nearly another $200 million in long-term affordable housing and at the same time enhances shelter opportunities and supported services for people experiencing homelessness. This budget continues investing in our fight against COVID-19. You know, the emergence of Omicron tells us we're not done with this pandemic and it's not done with us. It's a reminder that this is a challenge and a fight for a long period of time and how fragile our economic recovery might be. Our budget provides funding that we need to finish repairs to the West Seattle Bridge, to complete the vision of a renewed downtown waterfront park, bringing rapid ride transit to Madison Avenue investing in the South Park neighborhood and continuing to work with Sound Transit to expand light rail throughout our region. These projects will benefit not just individual neighborhoods, but our whole city, enhancing our city to truly be that city of the future that can serve all residents justly and equitably. Our focus also underlines our joint commitments to expand educational access and enhance our workforce training. With me today is Chancellor Pan, who has just been an incredible ally with the Seattle Colleges in expanding our Seattle Promise program, making sure those students are supported, because we know educational justice is so critical to actually opening long-term opportunity to make sure that we truly are a city where everyone can thrive and prosper. The free tuition and educational supports will allow some of our best and brightest students to actually succeed in their lives in ways they couldn't before. I'm so proud of how, long, how much we've expanded that program. Majority of the students who've entered it now are students of color. At least a third of them are the first in their family to go to college. And to, also with the colleges, we've also made, as we know two weeks ago, we announced a, uh, a, a partnership with the Opportunity Scholarship Fund, the state one, and we have a, a partnership with the, uh, UW so that these students, if they want, can transfer to become a Husky. Well, I'm proud of the investments that our budget makes in the future. I, I will say, and everyone knows, I still disagree strongly with Council's continued failure to adequately support the retention, recruitment, and training of Seattle police officers at a time when our public safety needs are increasing. Their actions and their lack of support have led to too many officers leaving that is unsustainable. Yes, we absolutely need to increase alternatives to police response, and this budget does it. The budget that I propose does that. 
One program we created and expanded, Health One, has shown how effective it can be when we are able to have a social worker and medic arrive in, instead of a police officer. But it's a false choice to think that we have to choose between alternative responses and police responses. The city of Seattle needs both. And we need every emergency when someone calls 911, when they need a police officer, we need one to be able to show up 24 seven. In January, I really hope that the council that's sworn in works with the mayor elect to address this critical issue for the city of Seattle as quickly as they can. Despite these reservations, I will be signing this budget. While I disagree strongly with some of the things in it, I disagree even more strongly with the emerging political dynamic that we have to be in a take all or nothing world. To move forward as a city, to meet the challenges that the city has, we must focus on our common ground. Overall, in a budget of $7.1 billion, Council really changed relatively little, and the final budget almost wholly reflects those priorities I set out for the people of Seattle in August. Despite the changes that they made, I believe that we're making incredibly good progress on many issues. And I, again, I know that Mayor-elect Harrell's, one of his big priorities is going to be in the area of public safety, and I hope the council after the first of the year works with him to address these issues. I believe that we can move forward as a city. As my last budget that I'm able to sign, I wanna say thank you to the people of Seattle. It has been an incredible honor to serve as mayor. I think this budget reflects so many of the priorities that we as a city share. We are focused on creating opportunity for our youth, enhancing public safety, having that city of the future that can really lead the way, not just on innovation, but on equity and justice. We all know that the changes demanded in the streets take hard work to implement. But this budget gets us closer to that truth, investing in communities of color to provide opportunity and true public safety through investment in education, access to affordable housing, health care, and the like. So I'm very honored to be able to sign this budget, and I'd now like you to hear from Police Chief Adrian Diaz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you to Plymouth Housing for hosting this uh, here. Uh, places like this are so essential to address a lot of the unsheltered population and homeless population that we've, you know, sometimes are having to deal with out on the streets. So I want to begin uh, by thanking the mayor for her leadership on this budget. I also want to thank her for the last four years of, of her service. I also want to commend the members of the Seattle Police Department that have worked tirelessly in recent months in addressing so many of public safety challenges. Together we have changed how we facilitate demonstrations. We participated in and implemented recommendations from the Officer and Inspector General set and review process. We've launched a series of reconciliation and peace dialogues in our communities. We've continued to reduce use of force, particularly when in, in addressing or dealing with people in crisis. We've developed and launched a new technology projects to increase efficiency, supervision, wellness, and transparency. We've designed the policing's first data informed management meeting focused on how we police with equity, accountability, and quality at the foundation. We began work to have new recruits participate in a community-based training focused on relationships, social emotional learning, and approaching interactions with a trauma-informed perspective. Much of this work has been done as we face staffing crisis, showing a remarkable commitment of our members to this department. To fully commit this work and to continue to innovate, we need more support. That's why it's so important the mayor's executive order and this budget together gives us the tools to recruit as many officers as we can for the remainder of this year and hopefully throughout 2022. We will continue to highlight the need for more officers and we need to retain the officers we have. I'm gonna work with everyone I can to get that done. We are laying a strong foundation of investments to continue to set a national standard of fair, just, transparent, and effective policing. The Seattle Police Department is committed to continuing all of the rebuilding efforts we have undertaken in 2021, and will continue on that path for 2022 and beyond. I look forward to working closely with city leaders, including the city council, towards a future that is safe, just and equitable. 
And I'll turn this over to Andrea from Plymouth Housing. Thank you, Mayor Derrick, and thank you, Chief Diaz. We know that permanent supportive housing is the solution to homelessness. And it's what Plymouth does every day. We are so pleased to see the mayor and the council's budget reflect the city's commitment to increasing investments in what we know works and prioritizing the jumpstart funding for supportive housing. Here at Kristen Benson Place, we celebrate a unique partnership between multiple departments for the Workforce Development Program, including the Office of Housing, the Office of Arts and Culture, and the Seattle Center. Proceeds from the voter-approved Seattle Housing Levy, in addition to public dollars and support from the donors to the Plymouth Housing's Proof Capital Campaign, funded this beautiful building that provides 91 new homes to people who have experienced chronic homelessness. And I'm excited to share that today, everyone has moved in. As a permanent supportive housing provider, Plymouth Housing relies on the City of Seattle's investments and the support of our entire community to deliver on our mission. We're about to open four more properties over the next year. In addition to the need to fund new supportive housing across our region, there's also a critical need to increase investments in the exi existing supportive housing to address the rising costs and to provide competitive wages for our staff. We are pleased to see that our partners at the city recognize this need and they increased current contracts in this budget by 5.8%. We look forward to a future where everyone in Seattle has adequate housing. Thank you. And I offer this. Thank you, Mayor Durkin. It is honor to be here today as you sign the 2022 budget that continues significant support for education and in particular, the Seattle Promise Program. In the midst of a global pandemic, the Seattle Promise Program continues to guarantee Seattle public students two years tuition free at Seattle colleges. This fall, more than 1,100 Promise students are enrolled. They're working towards a degree or certificate for many of them that might, might otherwise not be possible without the tuition. We know the students today are facing significant challenges with COVID area, learning, rent, childcare, and in some areas, for some of them, juggling multiple jobs. And particularly for our students of color, students with disabilities and who are caregivers are facing even greater disappropriate disappropriate impacts. This year's budget investment supports education equity with a three-year, nearly $11 million investment that allows students who have to drop out during the pandemic to re-enter and restart their education. Flexible COVID-19 enrollment policies are in place, which will enable more students to receive free tuition equity scholarships, and completion supports even for a third year if necessary. This investment provides dedicated support for promised students transferring to the University of Washington, as Mayor just mentioned, including support with admissions, coursework, and progress monitoring, so ensure these students succeed and get a four-year degree. Finally, this investment expands equity scholarships and creates first ever municipal match for the Washington State Opportunity Scholarship. This is an important state program that will help train students in critical science, technology, engineering, mass fields with up to 22,500 inflexible financial aid support for a four year degree. That's significant. It's huge. Mayor Durkin, you have been such a wonderful, steadfast, powerful champion advocate. We thank you for your leadership. While this may be your final budget signing, we at the Seattle College sincerely hope you will continue your advocacy for this 
impactful program that has the ability, actually is already changing lives. Thank you again for you, all you've done for our city for educational equity. Thank you, Mayor Durkin. Thank you very much. All right, I will sign the budget now and then take some Q&A. Um, I do want to say uh, words about the name of this place, Kristen Benson. Um, she was a dedicated worker for DESC who was lost in a tragedy last fall, showing both how much a person gives to their work and sometimes the jeopardy that can bring. So I want this is a real tribute to her because her name lives on and the work she does lives on. I also want to thank Paul Lambros, who can't be here, who's had some health challenges. He has been such a steadfast and remarkable advocate, not just in this sphere, but in spheres before that in the fight against AIDS and for LGBTQ rights. And I'm sorry Paul couldn't be with us today, but he's just a remarkable person and we're very lucky that his vision is coming true today as well. So with that, I will be signing the budget. <laughs> the city of Seattle for 2022 has its budget and it makes very important investments in the health and future of our city um, continuing the fight against COVID-19, making sure that we provide educational access for our youth, investing in our communities of color, ensuring that affordable housing can be available in every part of the city and is paired with workforce development, and then working really hard to make sure that we have a comprehensive plan of public safety for every neighborhood that weaves together both alternatives to policing when that is appropriate and adequate police across the city. And with that, I'll take some questions if there are any. The Regional Homeless Authority's first big push was to uh, work to do something about chronic homelessness. It's my understanding that that was cut from the budget. What happened? So the, the, um, we put some money into the Regional Homeless Authority and we'll be carrying through um, nearly $100 million from the City of Seattle. They had wanted additional funding for chronic homeless services in downtown, the downtown core. The City Council decided not to fund that money. Um, but I think we'll be working with the regional authority. I think that it will be really important for not just the city of Seattle to engage, but that we get engagement from all of the suburban cities because that regional authority will only succeed in the long term if we have not just buy-in by being at meetings, but buy-in by committing resources, and most importantly, providing services and housing in their own cities. Thank you. I have a question for the chief. All right. Of course. Um, I, I was just hoping you could clear up some of the back and forth that happened during this budget cycle with the council president, Gloria Gonzalez, um, who, who said repeatedly that she was, that the council was meeting your staffing requirements and your staffing needs through this budget cycle, but, but you said otherwise, and then obviously there was a question about this abrogation of 101 positions. She also said it was mischaracterized by you. I'm hoping you can clear that. Yeah, so what I've, I noted in my video was 101 positions uh, would be abrogated. Last, this, this year in 2021, we lost 140 positions to, to abrogation. Um, so that would have uh, put us down 241 positions. Uh, and we don't, it takes a lot to get those positions back. And for me, I had to make sure that, number one, it wasn't an additional cut uh, to uh, our department. I use some of that money when I'm not, when I haven't filled those positions for a variety of different things from technology to equipment to tools and everything to make sure that we are finding efficiencies uh, to do our job. And so that is, you know, why it might not have impacted in 2022. It would have had a great deal of impact in 2023. And so I, for me, was making sure that I highlighted that what that was potentially going to lose. Um, 
what those officers' potential work was going to lose and the impacts that it might have on public safety. What do you believe normal staffing is? Because I've, I've yeah. heard the mayor-elect say it's over 1,400 officers. Yeah, so for me at this point, 1,400 officers is what I need. We've had a variety of different staffing studies that will tell you that we need close to 16 to 1,700 officers. And I don't disagree with that. I think it would, right now, in the short term, uh, it would take a lot to get up to that range. Uh, so right now, it is trying to make sure that we are filling the needs so our officers aren't having to augment, uh, you know, just shifts, just to hit minimum standards, our minimum staffing uh, when it comes to patrol, making sure that our detective units are all uh, staffed appropriately for all of the follow-ups from sexual assault to DV. Um, so those, so right now, my initial staffing is trying to make sure that we meet the 1,400. Bottom line, Chief, do you believe Seattle is safe? Yeah, we are working every day to you know make sure that the city is as safe as it can be. Uh, you know, we've had challenges. We've had 325 less officers uh, this year alone. Uh, are th from last year to this year, uh, which makes it, when I've always said it, it consider that north of I-90, that is the amount of officers that I have staffing from east, north, and, and west precincts. And we are still, we are still responding to 911 calls. We are still, you know, addressing all the shots fired. We're still, you know, making sure that people are safe. Um, we've actually seen a reduction in uh, homicides from last year to this year, but we have not seen a reduction in the amount of victims that are being shot. Um, so I believe we are doing everything we can with, with the staffing that we have to making sure that the city is as safe as can be. How many officers do you have now? And how many will you have in the budget in 2022? So we're around 1,200 officers uh, currently. Uh, and like I've said, we need to be around 1,400. How many are deployable? Uh, uh, right now, 1,000 are deployable. Uh, and so we had not seen numbers like that since I've been, uh, since I've been on 25 years. And so this is considerably lower. We've also increased uh, our population by over 250,000 in that same amount of time. So you know, we, that is why it's so important to retain our officers, but also hire really good officers. This year alone, we've hired 42% uh, of our hires are people of color. Over 20% are female. So we are hiring the right people uh, to do this job, but we just need to hire more. So let me get that right. You're saying there's a thousand deployable officers, and you need 16 to 1700 officers in this city. Yeah. So I've, as I've noted, the, some of the staffing uh, reports have noted 16 to 1700. For me, it's trying to get to 1400. Right now, I do have 1200. When it looks to uh, you know recruits, uh, those that are in the FTO phase, uh, also those that are currently you know anything from military leave to uh, people out on pregnancy, etc. So you you do see that reduction that, that does drop down as far as deployable, um, but I actually need to get, at least in the short term, to 1,400. With this budget, can you get to 1,400? Yeah, you know, that is, I'm gonna still need to work on being able to have retention bonuses and finding ways that we can retain our people, uh, but I also need to make sure that as we move into 2022, that I also have incentives to hire the best of the best. Um, and, and those are things that I'm committed uh, to, to working with city leaders and city council to ensure that we are actually hiring the right people as well. So you can get to 1,400 for I, I think it would be a stretch to get to 1,400 uh, in this year alone, uh, in 2022, but I am committed to try and doing everything we can to do that. Chief, so what is it going to take, you think, to get to the number that you want to, especially with, I guess, the budget that you have, and then the mayor's leaving, you're going to have a new mayor, council is still going to be there, the majority of it. So what is it going to take to, to get to that? You know, I, it, we need support. Um, we need support from city council. We need support. I believe I have. We have the support of the mayor elect. We have the support of the mayor, uh, and as she is outgoing, she's already put an executive order. Um, and so I believe that that we're on the right path to it. Uh, but we also need community support. We need to make sure that we um, have those have that financial incentives to be able to hire the best. Because right now, every agency across this region has those incentives. And so we need to be on a level playing field with, with all the other agencies as well. Chief, I don't know if you've seen the Police Officers Guild president has seen this budget. He likes it. He's said it's an important pivot uh, in terms of where the city is headed to support officers. Do you celebrate this budget in the same way? You know, like, like I mentioned, I, there's many aspects of this budget that I support. Um, I wasn't supportive of the cut, of the nine and a half million cut, but I am excited for the CSO program. 
Uh, we have, you know, also had those investments in trying to find alternatives uh, to policing, and I think some of that is supported in that. Uh, but I also want to make sure that I use some of that money uh, that we had cut to, again, retain our officers and also be able to have uh, offer incentives. So, yes, I have a little bit. Question there. So your budget concern for this year is not base funding to hire those officers, but incentive funding to get the officers you want? Oh, yes. It's both. So, where are you with the incentives uh, to, for, for hiring, the hiring bonuses? So up until the end of the year, uh, so uh, up until the end of 2021, the mayor's executive order is in place. Uh, so anybody that is hired up until the end of the year, and then we will work with the city leaders, city council, and others to try and figure out what looks forward to 2022. But it is important for me to have, at the very beginning of the year, uh, as people are trying to get into this workforce, uh, that we have those incentives uh, in 2022 for the, for the whole year. Yep. Let me just, I just want to follow up on two things that underline this. It is not just numbers. Every time the city council cuts the police, or fails to fund what we need to do to attract and retain the best police, it tells police who are on the beat today, you're not appreciated. And that's why we are losing so many officers. It is not just the cuts themselves that hamper Chief Diaz from being able to recruit and keep the best officers. It is the clear message that the officers feel from that city leadership. And that's why I really hope that there is a change in attitude and collaboration after the beginning of the year with the new mayor elect and with new council members who are seated in the old council members to really roll up their sleeves and, 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 and see how we can move forward together to protect the public safety of the city of Seattle. You know, the King County Council is considering not just incentive bonuses and retention bonuses, they want to give thousands of dollars to every deputy sheriff who is there today. That tells those officers that they are valued. Why I entered the executive order that said we needed to have incentive bonuses so we could hire and retention bonuses is because we're competing not just with every police department of note in this region, but nationally. Um, police officers, social workers, all the people who are on front lines right now are hard to find. And we have to, as a city, be addressing our public safety by having incentives for police. At the same time, we're helping places like Plymouth attract and keep the very best people. We, one of the things that has hampered us in bringing more people inside for homelessness is our shelter providers don't have enough staff. So we're limited in terms of the number of people we can bring in. So there is a crisis on both sides, and that's what we think, I think the city council next year and the mayor need to do is not have it an either or or zero sum game for either side, but to figure out how to work together to collaborate to make sure that we have both things to protect the public safety of the people of Seattle. You Go ahead. Sir, you mentioned that, you know, obviously you're signing this. And welcome back. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you could have vetoed this. Um, we've seen you veto it in the past. Uh, but obviously, you know, you, you mentioned you, you didn't like the take all, leave all approach. In terms of policing, what was sufficient enough that allowed you to stomach this? Because this will hold your name even when you're obviously out of office. It does. And I, I thought very hard about it. And I think I have serious reservations, as I said, about how they've addressed public safety, not just because they have not given adequate funding to staff up to 1400 because they're staffing, quote, current levels. One of the things that I've asked Chief Diaz to do for the incoming mayor is to have a plan on how they can accelerate and do more hiring than we have traditionally and have because we're seeing other cities in America be able to hire more. Um, but if you look at on balance, it's about a $7.1 billion budget. At the end of the day, the areas where the city council and I disagreed on the policy is probably in the neighborhood of 10 to $20 million. We have to be able to have collaborations to respect the views of others, to continue working, and not just say it's everything I want or nothing. Um, and I think that goes both to council and to the mayor-elect, that we have to, I think, um, government, not just in our city, but across the nation, we have had become so polarized and it has been through the lens of there can only be one winner, my way or nothing, that that is really dangerous for democracy. And at the end of the day, we have to really address what do the people need, the businesses, the residents, um, and that's got to be our focus. So what, what did you propose and what did you end up with for public safety? 
the, um, the amounts and areas that we propose for public safety, they funded everything except for about nine and a half million dollars. And that nine and a half million dollars was for additional CSOs and also f mostly for incentives to be able to hire and some retention and wellness programs. So what's the total? It's just about nine and a half million dollars in the public safety sphere. Pam, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question, Chief. Uh, not Chief Mayor. Um, do you think your budget is going to address some of the critical needs? I know you talked about the homeless part is, is a big part of this, um, especially in places like Ballard Commons Park and the, and the crisis there. What are we going to do about that situation? Yeah, you know, this. I think this budget sets up the mayor-elect to have some successes, but those successes will only come if the regional homeless authority actually works as a regional entity. Um, we know now that approximately six out of ten of the people who are homeless in Seattle that we're supporting became homeless somewhere else. And it's the people of Seattle who are providing both the services and housing for great places like this. Um, and we also have, as I said, the limitation on shelters. We're now finally able to, to, we're able to open like Kiro, uh, place on Queen Anne and other shelters. So as we speak, there's, you know, extensive outreach to both Broadview Thompson and Ballard Commons. So hopefully that those encampments will be resolved before the end of the year. So I think it has to be done in partnership with having more resources available. But Seattle can't do it alone. The scale is just too big. And we need those other cities, Renton, Bellevue, Kirkland, Auburn, Federal Way, to step up and to address the people in their own communities to provide both affordable housing and support services for people experiencing homelessness. Two more? Yep, I've got, I've got two. Well, All right. Thank you. So the city center streetcar, is it in the, to finish it, is it in the budget, and why or why not? I believe, I'll have to check on that. I believe that it, the study of it is in the budget. Okay. Well, we got one more over here. <laughs> oh, does the budget pass? What's your priority for the last few weeks of your administration? You know, our priorities are really clear. Number one, we are still got to be COVID, COVID, COVID. With Omicron coming, I want to just take this moment in time to say to everybody, get your vaccination or get boosted. We will be extending the hours for some of our clinics. We'll be announcing what those are soon so that more people can go in, get their free vaccination or free booster. We know that that's gonna be the number one thing that both protects people from getting COVID, but also protects against serious disease. You know, every time we think that we're done with this virus, there's a new twist. And we don't know yet about Omicron, but what it appears is it's much more transmissible. Um, and if that's the case, it will first go to people who are unvaccinated. That's where we'll see it, and it will, again, crush our hospitals. So number one, still fighting COVID, making sure people do what they do there. Second, we're going to be announcing some additional great housing investments through our NOFA to see that we are still committed to providing housing and equity in our city. Third, we want to make sure we continue to work on the public safety front, both the alternatives to policing and with Chief Diaz to make sure that we have a plan in place that the mayor-elect can take up. We've been working very closely with Mayor-elect Harrell to see what he needs from day one to make sure that they have all the information about every department, what the challenges are for our city, so that nothing can be lost there. And I think that kind of change in government is really important in a democracy, to make sure that you work with who's coming in, because all of you serve the same people, and that's the people of Seattle. Mayor, sorry, speaking of Omicron, I mean, Lumen Field was such a huge success. Any plans to maybe bring back mass vaccination sites to get more people boosted and vaxxed? You know, I think we'll have to see what happens. Obviously, we won't be doing it in the next four weeks, um, but we've been talking to Mayor-elect Harrell and his transition team about the nece necessity now of reevaluating, as we did every step of the way, where are we on COVID, what do we need to do? The president announced today that they will be providing new resources we don't see yet how those are going to be pushed out, whether it's going to be to states, to public health, to cities. But they're going to be doing, for example, vaccine, uh, mobile vaccine clinics that will go and have whole families can come or at home testing. So it's going to be really important. One of the things we've been very fortunate in is, you know, we have a really strong working relationship with our congressional delegation. And we were able to get in the initial legislation, designated money for the city of Seattle on that first round to fight COVID. Having those resources is going to be critical moving forward. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for everything. Thank you.